summer can be a bit of a slog. For us, it's often for some reason a rather busy time, and I'm sure we're not alone. Well, you can beat the summertime sadness and the August angst and enhance your everyday with our excellent sponsor, Via Hemp. This is a company that crafts award winning premium THC and THC free gummies. Each of these gummies is especially designed to cultivate a specific mood. Whether you're looking to get relaxed, get quality sleep, get creative, or just to get focused. If you're 21 or older, you can experience it for yourself and get 15% off your first order with our exclusive code MSHEET at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. I personally enjoyed their grapefruit flow state gummies. This CBG and CBD powerhouse really helped me tap into my productivity. Like, we have had an extremely busy summer, and I feel Flow State got me over the finish line a few times. When I was editing multiple episodes a day, digging through documents, and knocking out a bunch of interviews. Biohemp does not require a medical card, and it ships legally to all 50 states. It's also affordable, and even more so for Murder Sheet listeners who get a special deal. If you're 21 and older, head to viahemp.com and use code MSHEET to receive 15% off. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P dot com and use code MSHEET at checkout. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Enhance your everyday with Via. This season, Instacart has your back-to-school. As in, they've got your back-to-school lunch favorites, like snack packs and fresh fruit. And they've got your back-to-school supplies, like backpacks, binders, and pencils. And they've got your back when your kid casually tells you they have a huge school project due tomorrow. Let's face it, we were all that kid. So first call your parents to say I'm sorry, and then download the Instacart app to get delivery in as fast as 30 minutes all school year long. Get a $0 delivery fee for your first three orders while supplies last. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Okay, it's time to commit. 2024 is the year for prioritizing yourself. Begin your new smile journey with Byte, and you could start seeing results in just two to three weeks. Just order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Byte clear liners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces, plus they offer financing options, accept eligible insurance, and you could pay with your HSA, FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of violence and murder. The killing started in Indianapolis. On April 8, 1992, 26-year-old Robin Fuldauer was by herself in the Payless shoe store she managed. The business was right next door to a busy gas station, but no one seems to have noticed when a man came into the shoe store, shot Robin to death, and then disappeared. But he was only getting started. Over the next month, this unknown killer would murder a total of six people in stores in Indiana, Kansas, and Missouri. Because his victims tended to be in areas easily accessible by the highway, he became known as the I-70 killer. Not much is known about him or his motives. He did not sexually assault his victims. He did not steal large amounts of money from the businesses. Many suspect he may have murdered for nothing more than the joy of killing. We've covered this case before. We did an extensive interview with Mike Crook, one of the key investigators on the case. We will link to those episodes in our show notes. Today, we will talk with Bob Cyphers, a reporter who has been on this story from the very beginning. He just wrote a terrific book on the case. Dead End, Inside the Hunt for the Interstate 70 Serial Killer. In this volume, he includes details never before revealed, and also goes into the chilling possibility that the I-70 killer may have continued to claim new victims long after his 1992 crime spree. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're the Murder Sheet, 
And this is Hunting the I-70 Killer, a conversation with dead-end author Bob Cyphers. We started our conversation with Bob by asking him to tell us about his background and how he came to be involved in the case. I'm a retired journalist, just retired last year. I've worked in newspaper, radio, television, small markets, middle markets, large markets. Uh, my last 30 to 35 years were at um, KMOV TV, the CBS affiliate in St. Louis, where I was um, a senior news editor and uh, for my last year, I really spent it working on the I-70 case, going with the police departments and FBI as they launched a task force around the country at the various cities. And KMOP gave me in my last year the opportunity to spend time working on that, do it well. Um, I think a lot of times for in this day and age for news websites, especially for TV stations or newspapers, they're just a rehash of the headlines of what they have on their newscast or in their paper. And came when we wanted to do, you know, some longer form magazine style stories, if you will, that don't really appear on the newscast that went in depth. They gave them some investigative credibility. And I probably wrote, I don't know, 20 or 25 stories on the I-70 killer during that last year. And then retired and thought, well, that's it. But I kept in touch with the police departments. And it was like, well, Bob, what are you going to do now? And it's like, well, I got a few things on my mind, like bad golf, uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. And, um, well, we'd like to keep this story alive as best you can, Bob. Do you have any ideas? And, you know, so finally, okay, I, I think I can write a book. And so I sat down, and uh, I had no idea how the publishing world worked. I thought if you sent a book off and people liked it, they'd print it. And I sent this off, and, and I couldn't get any response at all. And finally, I reached out to a agent or a publisher, and I said, what's the problem here? And they said, well, let me see, Bob, how many social media followers do you have? Oh, God. I said, I'm a 65-year-old man. I have none. <laughs> We're not we're not taking your book. Do uh, you think we have your people sitting around all day in rooms just reading books that we're paying? And I kind of thought, well, I guess I thought you did. Uh, maybe they did in the old days. Um, but I didn't fit the profile. An unknown first-time guy with no social media followers. So finally, though, Genius Books, who specializes in true crime, they came across it. They liked it. They took a chance on it. And here we are. I'm so glad they did. And it, it is disturbing. We've we've had our own interactions with the true crime publishing world at times. And we've heard before, well, it's not solved. So there's no ending. And it's like, but but you, we want there to be an ending. So we want to put the information out there. And it, it could be very odd um, for people who have not experienced it before. I want to ask you something. Yeah. You've, you've owned this story. And part of that has been building that rapport with the people on this task force that have dedicated so much time to this. How as a reporter, uh, you know, starting with your initial reporting and then moving into the, the book side of things, how were you able to do that and form those connections and build up that trust? Well, that comes over time. And I think one of the problems with journalism or reporters around the country, and it's not a knock, it's just it's almost like a minor league baseball team where if you're in the rookie league and do well, you move up to class A and then double A and then triple A, eventually the major leagues. Reporters and journalists are constantly moving around the country, and so they're not in one place for a long time to build up sources. Uh, I made it to St. Louis in a major market TV station by the time I was 30, I guess, and so I stayed there. I've had, I had opportunities to leave, but I had a family to raise. I really kind of stopped the Bob train for the career and raised my family, and I stayed there. And by staying there, when everybody else was kind of coming and going in the market, it allowed me to build up some sources and a reputation with uh, with 
a lot of people, not just police officers, but it could be anybody in any source of government. And a journalist is only as good as his sources. And so I think when the time came and the task force wanted a media person to travel with them around the country and do all these stories, you know, at first it was like, wow, thank you guys for picking me. And it's like, uh, Bob, like, you didn't beat out a lot of people, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. Well, well, you stayed here for 35 years. Either you weren't good enough to go someplace else or we're stuck with you or whatever. But uh, they, I think they knew me. They knew the work I'd done. I'd done other cold case stories. There was really nobody else in the market doing that. And I had built up, again, some friendships over time with people, and especially on this case. I was there the first day this case broke and uh, in St. Charles. And so I followed this case for a long time. I think they knew that. I think I was probably uh, maybe a natural person for them. One more Bob-related question before we get into some case-related questions. Can you tell us about that first day when it broke, your memories of that? Sure. I recall it all. Um, and it's early in the book. It was a Sunday afternoon, I believe. Uh, it was in May 1992. Uh, I was working in the newsroom on the desk that day. Uh, we had another reporter and photographer. We had a reporter and two photographers working. And uh, the Cardinals were playing baseball behind me. It was a relaxing, beautiful spring day. And I heard on the scanner a homicide call for the Bogey Hill Shopping Center. And it's like this was a brand new really nice shopping center facility in St. Charles, a suburb of St. Louis, just off the highway. And my first thought was a homicide call there in the middle of a Sunday afternoon. All these people would be around. It was a major shopping center. It just didn't seem possible. Um, my other reporter and photographer were someplace else working on a story. So I grabbed the other photographer and I said, let's go. And we get out there, and boy, there's a big the parking lot packed with cars. There's shoppers going in and out of stores. Police have crime scene tape up, and I, we staked it out. And finally, I saw a police officer I knew. I waved him over, and I said, you know, this is kind of odd. He goes, you tell me. I go, we got a, what, a robbery? What else could it be? Nope, no, no, no money taken. Well, that struck me as odd. It's like, okay, it's like a, a rape or a sexual, nope. Uh, we have a disgruntled boyfriend. Nope. Well, what do we have here? And he's like shaking his head and it's like, we've got a problem here. We don't seem to have anything here. Um, and that set me off as just, you know, I remember driving back to the, to the station, talking to my photographer and saying like, you know, what could it be? We were tossing everything in our mind. It was like, there was just nothing that made any sense. And then sure enough, later, it didn't take long before, remember, communication wasn't the same back in the early 90s. The Internet really wasn't the same. Uh, police departments weren't talking to each other, but it didn't take long. St. Charles was the case where the ballistics matched up with the other cities, and they knew they had a serial killer on their hands. So as soon as they did, um, that was my sign to get back involved in the case. And I've been kind of watching it closely ever since. Let's jump back to the very first confirmed killing, which, of course, was Robin Fuldauer in Indianapolis, Indiana. Can right. you tell us a little bit about that case and what happened to Robin? Sure. You know, what, one of the saddest parts about all the cases is most of these victims were not even supposed to be at work that day. Um, Robin was filling in for a co-worker. And Terre Haute, Mick McCown, had gone to a chiropractor who told him to stay home that day from work. And Raytown, Sarah Blessing, was one of five people who had just started this business and they had a different day of the week to work. In St. Charles, where I was, Nancy Kipsmiller uh, volunteered to go into work so a friend could have that day off. I mean, literally, the fate of not even supposed to being there. And it started with Robin. And when I went to... Indy to deal with the police departments and the and their families and the friends and whatever. What struck me was how close that Payless store, which is now a Batteries Plus store, was to the Speedway gas station. I mean, it is just literally steps away. Um, the walk didn't take me 10 seconds. And so you're realizing again, he's killing somebody in a public place in the middle of the day and look at how busy it was right next door at the Speedway gas station. 
And one of the problems for the police department was how do you get away? Because nobody saw anything. Again, busy place, middle of the day, nobody sees anything. How does he get away? The Payless shoe store only had a handful of parking spots in front. And, you know, now police are thinking, did he pull into the Speedway gas station to go put gas in his car and walk next door and kill somebody and then pull out and leave? I mean, is it that bizarre? Is it that silly? Um, And so on that case, when I worked it, I had to find a crucial person for me, and her name was uh, Lucretia Gullett. Uh, she since remarried, but she was the woman working at Speedway that day. And the manager of the Payless store was trying to get a hold of Robin at the store on the phone, and Robin never answered for like an hour. So the manager of the Payless store eventually calls the Speedway store, and Lucretia is working behind the counter that day, and he says, hey, do you mind going next door? I'm trying to get a hold of my manager, and she's not answering the phone call, and I'm a little bit concerned. And Lucretia goes next door, and sure enough, um, the store is empty. There's nobody. There. There's one woman in there with a little kid looking at some shoes, and Lucretia realizes something's not right. Cash register was open. She couldn't find the manager. She asked the woman and her child to leave, and then she called police, and police came and found Robin's body in the, in the back room. It's just incredibly sad. And, you know, for Lucretia, all these years went by, 30 years went by. She never knew it was a serial killer. So I found her when I went there with the task force. I mean, she was stunned. She thought it was just a homicide scene. Something happened in her life. She was a semi-witness and she never really thought about it anymore. Well, now she's actively involved in trying to find out whatever she can. There was no getaway option for a vehicle. Police first thought it might be a hitchhiker or a truck driver, but there was no place for a semi-truck. There's a neighborhood behind the Payless store. And I think right now, if you go there and just say, what's the most likely scenario that could have happened here? He would have had to have parked a getaway car in that neighborhood, walk, you know, for 10 minutes to the store, if he didn't go and get gas um, and and kill Robin and then calmly walk back to the neighborhood where he would have had a car parked on the street and likely fled that way. It's, it's so bizarre as are frankly, all of these deaths. This episode is sponsored by auto trader credit scores, down payments, interest rates, car buying can be a numbers game, but you don't have to be a math expert to get the keys to your dream car. Just use Kelly Blue Book My Wallet on AutoTrader. Crunch your numbers and get your personalized results so you know exactly how much you'll pay each month for your car. It's like having a magic wand for your wallet. Presto! The car you've been wanting is now within reach. So hit the road and leave your calculator at home. Find your next car on AutoTrader.com. What makes a life a good one? Is it the adventure you have? Or the friends you find along the way. Maybe it's pursuing your passion while striving to protect, defend, and save what you believe in every single day. So, what makes a life a good one? In the Coast Guard, we think it's all of the above and more. But you'll have to find out for yourself. Visit GoCoastGuard.com to learn more. Um... So, so two and a half days after Robin was killed, Patricia Magers and Patricia Smith were both killed at a store in Wichita, Kansas. What can you tell us about that double homicide? That was probably the most odd of all. First of all, what's she doing in Wichita? Mm-hmm. Just a couple days later. Um, I don't think, and the police don't think he just happened to get in the car and say, I'm going to Wichita. You know, he had to have a reason to go to Wichita. It's just so far. If he's on a killing spree, he could have stopped 100 places before driving 600 miles or whatever to Wichita. But the incredible story about there was so many things that happened. There was a, uh, the store was closing at 6 o'clock. It was a bridal store, a wedding store. And um, a customer calls and says, hey, I've got a wedding in Wichita at 7 o'clock. 
I'm running a few minutes late. I got to get a cummerbund. I see your store closes at six. I can be there at like six oh five. Can you stay open just a few extra minutes for me, and I'll get there. I promise. Uh, Patricia Smith and and uh, Patricia Major is working inside. Both said, "Sure, we'll stay five minutes. Come on by." And so, right around six o'clock, when they're supposed to close, a man walks into the store. And uh, Patricia Smith is up front. Patricia Major is in the back, and and they obviously believe it's the Cumberbund man. Who else is coming in at six o'clock? Well, it wasn't the Cumberbund man. It was the serial killer. And he takes Patricia Smith back to the back where Patricia Majors is, and he shoots them both in the head. Um, Patricia Majors is dead instantly. Patricia Smith is fighting for her life. And then the killer begins to walk out the store, now five minutes later at 6.05. And guess who walks in? It was a man looking for the Cumberbund. Well, now you have an eyewitness. He sees the killer has a gun wrapped in a wedding veil that he obviously used to keep the noise down. And now the serial killer is confronted with a problem. Do I kill this guy? Do I let him go? He's seen me. And the Cumberman guy is quickly saying, turning his head, I, didn't, I don't see you. I see the gun. I'm leaving. I'm going away. He's trying to talk his way out the door. The killer is in between the door and the two dead women in the back. And I guess that conversation only lasts about 30 seconds. But the bottom line is the killer lets the man go. Uh, the FBI profilers in Quantico actually say it was a smart move by the killer. Because had he killed the man, we would have had three bodies there. It may have taken longer. It may have been a bigger scene. There may have been more clues. So he lets the Cumberman man go. And then he flees again. And again, the bridal stops in a very small strip mall off the highway. No place to park a semi-trailer. Does he possibly get away from the scene? And at the time, the Cumberman and police, he's scared. He does not call police. And that's a real key to the case and a sad one. He finally calls 911 about an hour later. Police rushed to the scene. Patricia Smith is still alive, clearly, but she passes away. Had the Cumberbund man called police earlier and the ambulance got there earlier, Patricia Smith may have lived. She may have been the eyewitness. Murder may have stopped at that point. And I can tell you that that traumatic experience of the Cumberbund witness. A, having come across the killer and gone through that horrific 30 seconds of his life, and B, realizing he didn't call the cops quick enough and he may have cost somebody else their life, and C, seeing that the serial killer came down and killed more people, it's really destroyed the Cumberman witness's ability to have a normal life and communicate with police. He was able to give police a composite that was their first composite sketch they had. And again, this was the second of the, of the killings. So we didn't have a bullet match yet. But at least we had a composite. But now we had three dead bodies in two cities within a couple of days, hundreds of miles apart. That is so sad about the Cumberbund man's uh, guilt that he's lived with as a result of this tragedy. Yep. And again, no robbery at the scene, no, no sexual assault. But police departments were talking to each other. Wichita didn't know about the Indianapolis case. But you can see it's the same M.O. It's off the interstate, strip mall. He probably thought there was just one woman in the store because Patricia Majors was in the back room. He probably had staked it out, watched the store, thought there was just one. He was probably surprised that there were two. Then he surprised again by the Cumberman guy. So the killer had to deal with a lot of things here. But now we had two, and now he's turning back around and going back to Indiana and going to Terre Haute. And some people theorize that he had another surprise there because, of course, his next victim doesn't fit the pattern, does it? Yeah, that's a very interesting question as to what nobody's going to know. So 
uh, the, the victim is a man named Mick McCown, Mike McCown. Um, and his victims are all females with net hair. Um, Mick had the brunette hair, he, and he may or may not have had a ponytail. He clearly had a ponytail at much of his life. Um, they're not certain if he had a ponytail, a long ponytail at that particular time. Um, but the store's name is Sylvia's. Okay, so it's a women's, you know, craft store. And perhaps he just saw, if he pulled off the highway and pulled in there, or perhaps he sees the store name. He sees somebody in the store that's a brunette. Maybe there's a pigtail. Maybe he just sees it from behind. But by the time he goes in, he's ready to kill. And he's got the gun out. And then he realizes it's not a woman. So the question becomes, did he even care if they were women? I think he probably did. But he's, again, caught by surprise. And this time he doesn't take the woman to the back room with the others and kill him. This time he does it on the spot as if he was perhaps afraid of it. He didn't want to get too close to Mick McCown in case McCown fought back. He didn't want to walk him to the back room because the women may have gone easily. The FBI thinks that to take the women to the back room, he had to be charming. He had to be like, hey, I'm just here to take some money. I'm not going to you come on back. It was non-threatening. And the women all went to the back room. In this case, there was no back room. There was no woman and, uh, it, it, and the killing happened quickly while Mick bent down to pick up an item to show the killer. He shoots him in the back of his head. The other interesting thing there, although, again, no money taken, Mick McCown's wallet was taken or is missing. And police at first theorized, okay, the killer took the wallet. But our serial killer really had no interest in money. He didn't take anything from the cash register. Why take the wallet? But the wallet's missing. Could Mick have placed his wallet elsewhere? Could he have lost it? The family looked everywhere for it and could not find anything. So the thought is still the killer, for some reason, took Mick's wallet. Well, that's a DNA hope for this case, because back in the 90s, DNA was semen and saliva. And he obviously did not leave any of those at any scene. But now DNA has evolved to what they call touch or handler DNA. And if he touched, if he grabbed Mick's wallet, he would have had this pants at some point. And the Terre Haute Police Department, down in their basement, in a box that has McCown's name on it, for 30 years, they kept his pants. They kept his pants. And they've shipped them off, and they're hoping for a DNA match that right now has not come. Through the efforts in the, the, the police have gone through to keep every bit of evidence in the case. But, yeah, the Terre Haute is different, but now he's committed three murders in what, a span of a week, back and forth across the country. But still, police have not put any serial killer tag on this. The police departments are not communicating. Wichita does not know about Terre Haute. Terre Haute does not even know about Minneapolis. It's just another crime on another day, and they have their hands full. And when they get a homicide in Terre Haute, they're not used to picking up the phone, calling Indianapolis, say, hey, do you have one like this, too? They have enough on their plate every day. We talked about the Terre Haute murder. Now we wanted to get into the case of Nancy Kitzmiller. Can you talk to uh, talk a bit about the circumstances around her murder? Sure. So that's the one that I worked in St. Louis at the TV station on the Sunday afternoon. And um, what was really interesting about that is, once again, we had no idea of the serial killer at that point. This was victim number four within you know, a couple of weeks, but I get a phone call from a police source that I knew in St. Charles that said, oh, Bob, you better come out here. And I wasn't even sure what it was about, but I knew he had some story for me that day. So I'm in the car and going out there and uh, he closes the door. I'm in an office and he says, Nancy's killer, uh, we believe is a serial killer. And I'm like, what? And he goes, the ballistics from our homicide scene match ballistics in Indianapolis, Wichita, and Terre Haute. This is the fourth scene where the ballistics all match. And I'm like, wow. And he says, we're going to announce it to the media uh, later today or tomorrow or whatever. And he goes, but there's something else. And I says, what? He goes, 
you're not going to believe what the gun is for the ballistics. And it's like nine millimeter, my revolver, you know, the gun the killer gets in the trunk of somebody's car on the bad side of town. You know, what is it? No, it's a gun that we think is a World War One German Navy target pistol that barely functioned 70 years ago. And it's like, what? It's like, and he's like laughing, like, it's unbelievable. But that's what it is. It was a gun called, an, they believed, an Irma Worky. They had two possible guns at that time, an Irma Worky or a Scorpion. They believed it to be the Irma Worky. And he's like, there's no way that this could possibly be happening. There's just no way. No killer chooses this gun to kill somebody. This gun's probably never been used in a homicide anywhere in the world outside of the war ever. And it's a gun that is now used by a serial killer 70 years later in homicide. I mean, that was just stupid. And now you add in the fact that there's no motive, there's no robbery, there's no rape, there's nothing. He's just getting off the highways. And now we realize, as they, they'd already talked to Wichita and Terre Haute and Indy, now we kind of realize that whatever was happening here was completely off the, off the rails. That there was no, they were going to contact Quantico to look for a full file, but there was just nothing that made any, every time they opened the door on this now, it got more confusing. So they announced to the press um, that the ballistics matched, but they did not announce to the press that it was the goofy gun. And um, there started to become a debate there among the police department and, and me, <laughs> representing, I guess, the only journalists that may have been involved. I thought they had to get this information out. I said, first of all, the public has a right to know. Secondly, it seems to be to me the key to solving the case. Somebody's going to recognize this gun and point to the guy. I mean, you've got to get this out. Police thought by getting it out, they were impeding the investigation. They wanted to hold stuff back. Um, at work now, my bosses knew I had something on this case that was new and legitimate and earth shattering. Uh, they didn't know what it was. I wouldn't tell them. I was protecting my source. Uh, the police department did not want me to go with it. Um, uh, again, there was debate. I, I again stuck my nose in and felt like they should both for the public and journalistically. I said, you know, this is breaking every code I know not to not to get this information out to the public. They deserve the right to know. There's a killer going on out there. It'd be nice if people knew, you know, as much information as possible. Anyway, that debate went on for a few days or weeks, and they finally did announce um, that they had the gun. Um, they announced it after the fifth killing, or the sixth killing, the fifth scene, in Raytown, suburb out of Kansas City. And once they announced they had the ballistics and they said the gun, the killing stopped. They just stopped immediately. And at first we thought like, I don't know, I can't speak for the police. At first I thought when they stopped, like, we scared him. He knows they've got the ballistics. He knows the goofy gun. He knows that can, the killer knows that information can crack the case. He has stopped. Maybe we've saved some people's lives. Maybe we did, but it probably impeded the investigation. Police felt like if it wasn't out there, that could have been something that could have helped them more because when the killings resumed in Texas, if they were indeed the I-70 killer, same motive, same exact thing, but he had changed his gun. And had they not put the ballistics out with the Irma working gun, they'd again had more evidence going forward. So there's two sides to that coin. Um, but it was an important side, and it was a, a difficult debate and decision by the police department. I think the only one of the confirmed cases we haven't discussed yet was Sarah Blessing. Can you uh, tell us about that case and about the witness, Tim Hickman? Yep, I really think it's the key to everything because of Tim. This is Wichita, this is um, Indianapolis to Wichita to Terre Haute to St. Charles to Raytown. Um, this is a strip mall. It's a much larger facility with a larger parking lot. It is an older strip mall. And it's a little bit off the beaten path for the highway. Um, but again, the ballistics are the same, so it's him. 
So we go there that day to uh, with the police to work the case. So what happens here is Tim Hickman owns a video store, which was right next to connected to Sarah Blessing store, which just had a grand opening a month earlier where the five women took turns working days. And Tim sees this guy walking right toward his window, kind of well-dressed, more well-dressed than the usual customers they got at that part of town for that strip mall. He had a blazer on, some slacks, well-groomed, preppy looking. And the guy comes right up to Tim's window and is just staring at it at the video store. And Tim looks right back at him. And once the killer realizes it's a man in there, he disappears. Now, Tim went to work early that day because he was relieving his wife and daughter, two women who had been working in the store throughout the day. And Tim wonders if the guy knew the women were in there during the day and came back and then was almost surprised to see Tim pop his head out the, out the window. And they stared at each other for, Tim says, you know, a good five or ten seconds, just eyeball to eyeball. And Tim doesn't think anything about it. And the guy leaves the window frame and disappears. And a minute later, Tim hears pop, 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 pop gunshots. And he goes out his door immediately, goes next door. And he finds Sarah Blessing, who was working alone in her store, laying dead on the floor. Tim, Sarah's store is the last store on the lot. Tim then goes around the corner of her store and sees the same man who he saw staring in his window, running as fast as he can up a steep hill to the highway to get away. And, um, and I went and looked at that hill. That's a difficult hill. And again, he didn't leave a getaway car parked in the parking lot. He obviously had a car parked somewhere, a vehicle on that hill. So I go to the store. I meet Tim. Tim agrees to talk to me. 30 years after the killing, Tim can barely speak about the crime without breaking into full tears. Heartbreaking. He will describe what happened, but when he gets to the, to the details, He's overwhelmed with grief. And, uh, you know, he knows he saw the killer. And he knows what happened. And he watches every day for something new on this case. Wants it all desperately. And uh, he's heartbroken. And the other funny thing about that case is we're there uh, talking to Tim and uh, Chris Shroud, the Raytown police detective. Um, we're getting ready to leave. And uh, a, ma- a car pulls into the parking lot. And a man is kind of looking at us, and he says, you're from the TV station, right? Yes, sir. How did you know? I saw on Facebook, somebody posted, you guys were here doing something. He goes, "On the, on the was it on that killing 30 years ago? And I, yes, sir, it was. And he's just looking at me. And I thought, well, he just wanted to come by and meet the TV crew or whatever. But he was clearly nervous, and he was uh, shy. And I was getting ready to leave. I said, like, have a nice day. And he, I hear him say, I was here that day and I kind of turned and looked at him and at first, you know, you meet a lot of people, you wonder if they, if they're really being truthful or if they want to be on TV or something. He was not looking to be on TV. He was now almost shaking. And I said, you were here the day of the killing. And he says, yes. I said, you talked to police because I'd gone through the police files. There was nothing about another witness. And he says, no, I've always been too afraid. I said, it's been 30 years. He goes, I'm still afraid. And I said, will you, will you talk to me? Will you tell me what happened? And he said, do you have to use my name? Do you have to, sh-? you know, he was not, do you have to show my face? He did not, I made it clear, you know, will you tell me the truth? He didn't want to be on TV. So I tried to talk to him. I said, if you can just tell me what happened, I'll get it to the police department for you. I gave him the police department's phone number, anything to help. And finally, he said he would talk to me. And uh, he wouldn't go on camera, but he'd tell me his story. And he said that day he was at a, a restaurant in the mall, the three or four stores down from the video store, and the same preppy-looking guy walks in, and he thinks the guy's overdressed for the place. And there's plenty of places to sit in a little restaurant. It was not crowded at all. And he said the man stood at the counter, and a waitress came and talked to him and pointed to all the empty seats and he says, I'm watching the guy, and I'm wondering why he's not going to sit down. The guy's just looking around. And then finally, the guy just turns around and leaves. 
And they said, I just found it odd. Who comes into the restaurant looking for a place to sit? You're by yourself. And then you just walk out and leave. And then he says he hears the next day about the killing. I hope he called the police department. I don't know. You know, you talk about police departments being up against the crime. Chris Shrouds in a small department in Raytown, they've had staff cuts. They've lost employees. I asked him about working on this case, and he laughed at me, and he says, Bob, I get 10 new things a day to try to get through. And over there in the corner is a stack of files that go almost all the way to the ceiling about some homicide 30 years ago. When would I ever have time to open one of those, Mm. much less a 1,000 of them? And uh, so it's frustrating. Um, But Tim Hickman is an eyewitness. To me, he's the best eyewitness. And, um, but you have to realize, even if the police called, caught a suspect and Tim looked and said, boy, that's the killer, you know, a defense attorney is going to put him on the stand and say, sir, this is your memory of 30 years ago, what the guy looked like when he was 28. And now you're telling me this guy sitting here that's 60 years old is the same guy. You know, if you're on the jury, obviously there's a shadow of doubt there. Absolutely. It's just, it's just that old. Um, I mean, but what you said about how this has affected Tim is just so, it's so poignant. And you yourself have met and interviewed so many friends and family members of the victims in this case. And, you know, just speaking collectively, how have these people been affected by not only the loss of their loved ones, but the uncertainty that remains around why this horrible thing happened to them? Yeah. I think back to Terre Haute, where I brought the two sisters together, Cynthia Brack and Teresa Lee. They had not spoken a lot in recent years. Time goes by. The herd has always been there. Um, they were still friendly, but they made it clear when they agreed to talk to me. They were coming from different places geographically, different points in their life, and it may be a difficult day for them. And I kept them on separate places in the parking lot. I interviewed them separately. I didn't make them mingle. And then finally, at the end of the day, I, I brought them both together. And, you know, we said a little prayer for Mick. And as we, as we went to leave, I saw them, you know, laughing and chatting and smiling. And I said to myself, something good happened here today, at least for those two, that maybe if they had weren't spending as much time as they used to together, they at least were today. And they mentioned about how Mick's father, after the, uh, after the homicide, when his son was killed, the dad had a, br- a brand new fancy car. He put it in the garage and stopped driving it. He only wanted to drive Mick's car because it smelled like Mick. And in Wichita, I brought I, I brought together um, Patricia Major's husband Mark agreed to meet with me. Patricia Smith's husband uh, Nick uh, no longer lived in the area, but I found a friend of hers named Ruth Ruth Feather. The two of them, Mr. Majors and Ruth, did not know each other. One's the husband of one woman killed. The other's a friend of another woman killed. They'd never met for 30 years. Different funerals, different services. They didn't know each other existed. But on that day, we were together in a parking lot. And again, as we left, I'm looking at the window, and those two are sitting and chatting and talking nonstop. And I get a text later saying, how incredible that day was for them that they got to spend the day together and talk to each other and tell stories and stories and stories about um, the two Patricias. And so again, out of something horrific, at least for some moment, something good took place. Yeah. It's absolutely tragic. And I just, I, I feel for these families and I hope they get answers through your book or, or through this, the work that the task force has done. One piece of work that's really interesting, and then you you sort of alluded to earlier in talking about the Cumberbund man, but the FBI did get involved in this and even put together a profile of the suspect, the unidentified suspect in this case. What did you find out that they thought this person who did this might be like? Well, I can tell you that uh, in Quantico, I dealt with Larry Ankrum, the top top guy. There aren't many guys that reach the level, or women, of FBI profilers. It's a very, very difficult and a small world there. And with this one, their hands go up in the air because 
there was nothing like this. You know, with Ted Bundy, well, he liked the college girls. Or with Jeffrey Dahmer, he's picking up the gay men. Or even in Indianapolis, where they looked, was there another serial killer in the area? Her boymeister was a serial killer in India along Highway 70, but it was gay men. They all had a motive. This guy has nothing that they can pin on. Again, no robbery, no rape, no no nothing. He doesn't know these. There's just nothing there. And and then you add in the gun. And then you add in the getaway car. And then you add in the lack of DNA. Even for the profilers, there wasn't much to go on. That said, they were able to come up with a couple of things. They believe he was from the Indiana, Indiana area because he started there and he came back there. They think that he plotted these things out in advance. They compare, Larry compared it almost like to a um, dating somebody where you have a plan of how you're going to call the girl up and ask her for a date, where you're going to take her, or going on a vacation, how you plan the vacation ahead of time. That he got great excitement out of the planning purposes. He wasn't just in his car one day and said, I'll get off and kill somebody today. He had to plan these out. But they couldn't find out anywhere he would stay afterwards. They felt like after he would kill somebody, it would almost be like finishing a sex act where he'd need to collapse. He was just ecstatic and he was exhausted. He was just wiped out. Where did he collapse at? They checked every hotel and every campsite. They had, they had a list of like 70,000 names of people that every hotel in every city within hundreds of miles, and they checked them all. One of the people they called and checked was Kevin Costner. Oh, <laughs> that. my gosh. Elliot Ness yeah. himself. Yeah. Kevin Costner is like, is this heaven? No, it's Wichita, Kevin. <laughs> you were in Wichita. <laughs> but nothing. Just no trace of this guy. So... Again, you're the profiler. Give me a, a nugget to go on. Larry Ankrum keeps using the phrase, I follow the cookie crumbs. There just were no cookie crumbs here because we've never seen this before. Had there been a sighting of a getaway car? Had somebody seen him in a semi-truck? Okay, that would narrow the list. But nothing. Just absolutely nothing. Could he have enlisted in the military while he took time off between these killings and the Texas killings. They checked everybody who enlisted. Nothing. Could he have gotten arrested for something else in jail? They checked everybody in that year's span. Nothing. Could he have been killed? They checked all deaths in the area. Nothing. There was just nothing for them to go on. And um, so for a profile, you know, in Wichita, the police uh, detective who's handling this case, a man named Tim Ralph, this is not his first rodeo. He handled the BTK killer. This is his second serial killer. Jim caught the BTK killer. Jim was a little boy going to grade school when the BTK killer, Dennis Rader, first started in Wichita, a terror that lasted nearly 20 years, killing a family of four down the street from where Tim lived. Jim would walk that street to school every day and was haunted. And his whole life, he kept thinking about that BTK killer. Jim winds up going to college, getting a job at the Wichita Police Department. Guys retire over the years. And what case lands on his desk? The BTK case. And Jim is like, wow. Well, the BTK killer, like um, the Zodiac killer, like the movie Desperately Seeking Susan with Madonna, tried to communicate with police through the newspapers in the classified section with secret names going back and forth with Tim. The BTK killer would leave a, he liked being called the serial killer. He'd leave a box of cereal on a, on a road with a flag on it. And some motorist would have to stop and pick it up in the middle of the road. And on the flag would be an index card saying, tell the police where this body's at. And the, the driver would call the police, tell them what's on the car. Police would go to some address and there'd be a body. BTK killer had killed again. It was a cat and mouse game. Uh, well, then one day the BTK killer, Dennis Rader, tells the police in the want ads, hey, can, technology has changed. I'm tired of this newspaper communication. Can I send you a floppy disk? Well, Tim says, sure enough, send us a disk. Dennis Rader makes the mistake of sending the police department a floppy disk. Tim takes it to the forensic lab, and they trace it to a church in town. And Tim goes to that church, and it's like, who 
would have had access to make this floppy disk. And they said the only person that has access to this is our church deacon, a deacon of the church named Dennis Rader. Then goes through the files to see if there was ever any car that was a seen at the, one of these serial box crimes getting away. And there was one spotted for a black Chevy trailblazer. Tim gets an address for Dennis Rader's house through the church, drives by his house, and what does he see parked in the driveway? Black Chevy Trailblazer. Jeez. And the next day, Tim's got his SWAT team out. They arrest Dennis Rader. He's handcuffed. He's put in the back seat of a cop car. And guess who's driving him to the police station? Tim Ralph. That's that's an amazing story. And you talk about do you talk about a ribbon on a box that had haunted Tim his whole life? Do uh, you think this serial killer is going to outsmart Tim Ralph? Um, they just need some break. They just need some lead. That's just an, an amazing story. Now, one thing in a case like I-70 is when you don't have the ballistics evidence, it can be very difficult to determine if whether or not other killings are potentially related or not. And you've already alluded to this a couple of times, but I wonder if you could discuss the Texas cases with us. Yeah, very interesting. So the killing stop once we get the ballistic information out for a year and we think, okay, the crime is dried up, but at least we've, we're not killing people. And then they start again in Texas, just off the highway, uh, two of them in Dallas suburbs. Marianne Glasscock and Vicky, Vicky, or, or, or Amy Beth. Same exact thing. In and out, gunshot to the head, no robbery, no nothing. Now, again, communication wasn't the same. It took a while for stuff to get filtered back to the I 70. Well, then the killer, if it is the same person, somebody goes down to Houston and goes into a store, and the woman working there alone is named Vicky Webb. And uh, he shoots her. He leads her to die. And as he's leaving, he realizes she's gasping for breath as she's covered her body in a pool of blood. He goes back to shoot her again, puts the gun to her head, pulls the trigger, and it jams. It clicks. Vicky just hears the click. Her life was spared, at least temporarily. Minutes later, he's, he flees. Customers come in. They find Vicky. They get her to the hospital. She lives. Vicky is scared to death. Because now whoever tried to kill her, she's never heard of the I-70 killer. Maybe it's the same guy, maybe it's not. But whoever tried to kill her knows she's alive. It's a big story. Vicky goes into hiding. She's not talking to anybody. She, the police can't find her. She gets divorced. She gets remarried a few times. She moves around the country. She changes her name. She's not seen by anybody anywhere for 30 years. I kind of felt like for the book, I needed to find Vicki Webb. Now, that's easier said than done. So I, I knew how old she was at the time. I knew 30 years had passed. All I had was a name. I went through marriage records, divorce records, real estate records, any records I could find of anything. And I narrowed a list down to about 600 Vicky Webbs, I think, in America. And I just started, I got phone numbers. And I just started calling. And you know how it is. Somebody calls your phone and you see it's a bad number. You just spam call. You're not going to talk to them. And, you know, for most of them, I didn't even get past hello. Sometimes it'd be, hello, my name is Bob Cyphers. I'm a report click. <laughs> hello, my name is Bob Cyphers. I'm a reporter for KMOB TV in St. Louis. And I'm looking for the Vicky Webb click. I mean, again, I give my work credit for letting me sit into a corner for weeks and make these phone calls and the newsroom's watching me as I stroll in each day half asleep. And eventually I had an index card with everything written out because I'm saying the same thing every time. Well, I make a phone call one day. Hi, sort of Bob. Yeah, my name is Bob Cyphers. I'm a reporter for CBS in St. Louis. I'm looking for the Vicki Webb who was shot and left for dead in Houston 30 years ago. I got through it. Wow. I had no expectation. And there was just silence on the other end of the phone. And I say, ma'am, are you there? And I hear this meek voice say, I'm here. And I pause and, you know, I'm wondering, I'm thinking, ma'am, are, are you the Vicki Webb that I'm looking for that was shot in Houston 30 years ago and left for dead? 
And she says, I probably am. And at that point, like chills are going through my body. And my fist, I remember, went up in the air. And all the people in the newsroom that have watched me do this effort and futility for a month come running around, getting around me. And um, I realized it was one thing to find Vicki Webb. It was another to find a woman who went into hiding for 30 years to talk to me. I knew to do that. I had to do just like I did police sources for years. I had to build up a level of trust. I had to get her to know me. I had to get her to trust me. And I told her what I was doing. I told her to Google my name. I told her to read all the stories I'd done on the I-70 killer. By now, she knew there may be a connection. And I said, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like you to tell your story that you've never told. And we had to develop. It took time. It took a, It took friendship over texting. Happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy birthday. How was your vacation? How was your daughter? And months went by. And um, have you read my stories? Yes, I did. Blah, blah, blah. Finally, I get a text that says, it's from Vicki, and it says, Bob, let's do it. And it was like, here we go. I found the woman the police couldn't find and uh, flew to see Vicki and had a wonderful couple days with her. And um, I think her story in the book is a, is a remarkable story. And to her credit, after that, she's now come out of her shell. She's done something with People Magazine, with uh, Discovery ID. Um, so she's made it clear she's no longer afraid that if, if it is the I-70 killer, she wants him caught. If it's not, she wants him caught, too. Uh, whether she's a victim of that or not, she was still a victim. I think anybody who reads her story has to have some understanding of how important it is to come forward and try to get this solved. Absolutely. And I just think that that portion of the book is such a testament to your journalism and the fact that it's kind of a th through line in a way of your career of like stay in place, build up trust, get the get the story, which is, as you said, not always common in today's media environment where it's just go on the next thing that's getting clicks. Right. And sure. I just think that's great because it's allowed this woman to reclaim her own story. Yep. And in this case, it was even harder because I'm trying to build up friendship and a relationship over a texting system. I don't know this woman. She doesn't know me. It's one thing to go visit cops every day for 30 years and say, hey, here I am still. It's another to do with a complete stranger who's in a horrific state of mind all these years. So, no, that was a that was a, a wonderful thing. I, I uh, very much so. And now I think where the case moves forward, as we've covered all these, is the Billy Brossman case. Yes, I wanted to go back to Terre Haute, and if you could tell us about that and its connection. So, ten years after the I seventy killing stop. So around 2001, 2002, I guess. Back in Terre Haute, just a mile away from Sylvia's where Mick McCown was killed, there's another killing. This time, though, there's incredible security camera footage, as good as you're going to see. Security camera behind the counter of a liquor store. The man, the, the man working behind the counter is named Billy Brossman in Terre Haute. Nobody's in the store. And then here comes a preppy looking guy that comes in the door. He walks to the back, he grabs a six-pack of beer, he brings it out to the counter, and he brandishes a gun. He makes Brossman walk to the back of the store, around the corner where you can't see the killing take place, but he shoots him. After he shoots him, he does a little celebratory dance in the aisle, and then flees out the door. He doesn't even come back to get his beer. He doesn't even go to the cast room. He only went into that store for one reason only, the thrill of the kill. The same motive for the I-70 killing. And this one is a mile away from where he killed, where somebody else was killed in Terre Haute. But now the police have incredible video. It's his, police, his face is, is, is right there for you. There's a wedding ring on his finger. So please start looking for DNA on the beer. They don't have a fingerprint. They don't have enough. Um, they put the they put the video on television around the clock for a week in Terre Haute, in Indianapolis, 
nobody comes forward. How can you not? How, how does nobody know him? Then we realized nobody came forward and nobody said they knew him because he's not from that area. He's an out-of-towner. Nobody's seen this guy before. Well, Tim Hickman might have. Tim Hickman might have. So please have the Brosman video. They've got the Brosman homicide. And now they start digging. They start looking for anybody anywhere that might recognize who this guy is. And finally, they do get a couple of tips from multiple people who say the same odd thing, as if odd things aren't enough yet in this case. <laughs> You know, we're not sure about the face, but we can tell you who that is because of the way he cuffs his pants. What? Look in the video at the way this guy cuffs his pants way up high. These are separate people telling the same story. We knew a guy who used to cuff his pants like that. Preppy looking guy looked about like this. But yeah, we kept thinking at the time, hey, Goofy, why are you cuffing your pants like that? And this guy in the video has got the same cuffs. Interesting. Again, does that hold up in court in front of a jury? But interesting. And then please come across another man from the original killing in Indianapolis of Robin Foldout. Right around the time of the killing, just a few minutes afterwards, there's a worker at a construction site that says a car pulls in from Florida with Florida plates, a green, a cream colored Cadillac. A man and a woman in the car. Man gets out and comes to the construction site and asks the foreman if there's any work in the area. He's looking for a job. The foreman says, "Yeah, come on with me. We'll go to the house. We'll go down to the shed down the block and we'll uh, we'll get you uh, an application. Get in the car. We'll drive down there." So they both all get in their cars and the foreman looks in his mirror and he sees the woman hand the man in the Cadillac a gun. Well, now the construction worker is scared and he decides he's got to lose this car. Instead of taking him to the construction headquarters, he's veering around the area, going through side roads, the car's still following him. Finally, he gets into some woods and the car goes away. He's thinking, gee, what happened here? Did I just dodge something? And the construction worker then starts hearing all the police sirens going like crazy. And he thinks they're looking for that guy. They're looking for that guy. No, they weren't. They were going to the Payless Shoe Store where Robin Fuldauer had just been murdered. So time goes by, and this guy comes forward to the police. Hey, you know, that killing, I see this in the news, and I'm not sure it's related, but here's what happened to me that day. Police say, did you get a good look at the gun? And the construction guy says, well, yeah, I got to look at it. I, I, pretty, I'm, I know a lot about guns. I know exactly what I saw. Please bring him in and lay about 10 guns at the police department in a room and ask him to pick out what gun he saw. And there's nine common guns there, and there's the goofy Irma Worky gun there. And he points right to the Irma Worky gun. Oh, my gosh. Nice. That's, that, that part of the book gave me chills reading about that connect, that missed, I mean, that and and to, to think a woman might have been involved, because to me, before I learned about that incident, I-70 always just struck me as a guy doing this by himself, like a phantom. But the fact that it might have been an accomplice also could explain why nobody's ever come forward about their boyfriend or husband, frankly. Well, I can tell you that the police department have had more people come in in the last um in the last year since the task force trying to ID the Billy Brosman person in the state. And I know, I don't know that this has happened, but I do know that they have been trying and trying and trying to get an ID on the woman in the car. And if they can get an ID on the woman in the car and the woman in the car could identify the male in the car, and the male in the car could wind up being the Brassman male. Now there's a path. Yes. So they are still trying hard. And let me tell you, when I talk about trying hard for these police departments, you think, okay, well, this case is 30 years old. Chris Trout in Raytown has files to his ceiling. He'll never get to them. 
but they did their task force. They did the best they could. They're sending off for DNA. They're waiting. But, you know, they got other things to do. In St. Charles, there's a woman on the task force whose name is Kelly Rhodes. Kelly has one job and one job only every day. And that's to solve this case. So two weeks ago, I am in one of the homicide cities doing a media tour for the book. And who shows up there at one of the police departments? Kelly Rhodes. Oh, by the way, Kelly's eight months pregnant. She ain't giving up on the case. She's working the case every day. So when people ask me, do you think it can be solved? Yeah. I think Kelly Rhodes can solve it. It ain't just sitting in some basement somewhere in a box. They're trying. I give them, I give them credit. And that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I'm spending my time and my money traveling around trying to get publicity on this to do anything I can for these, these police detectives. I talked about, you know, Tim Ralph in Wichita, you know, in, in St. Charles, there's a man named Pat McCarrick. He's retired now. He's getting up there in age. He can barely walk with a cane. I mentioned the one homicide case in, in Texas. Uh, Amy Vest was killed in the Dallas area. After she was shot and left her dead, she was barely alive. She could crawl to a phone. She could make a phone call to 911 pleading for an ambulance to come and get her. Pat McCarrick, who's working in St. Charles, Missouri, not in Texas, has the audio tape of Amy at his house in his drawer that he he can listen to to remind him never to let this case go dry. Pat McCarrick has gone out and bought an Amy Worky gun on eBay for $1,000 so he can take it to gun shows and gun clubs and ask people, has anybody ever seen anybody who's owned this gun? I mean... They're doing everything they can possibly do. It's just, it's just heartbreaking for me. And what a thrill it would be if I could see this through and in some way, shape, or form help the cops an inch along the way for the job they're doing. It would mean everything to me. Yeah, your, your passion for this case really comes through in, in the book and in talking to us. And we just want to say we really appreciate that. It, Do we have any information about the woman, what she might have looked like, or anything like that? This is the car from Florida? Yeah. I do not know. Okay. Other question. They they do. Okay. And then the other question is, I think I know the answer to one of these, but do you think the Brosman shooting and the Texas cases are both I-70, or do you think one of them is, or what are your opinions on that? Just my opinion, I do not believe that Vicki Webb's case in Texas is the I-70 killer. And Vicky doesn't know. And police don't know. Mike Crook, the original detective at Robin Fuldauer's case in Indianapolis, who's been to all the Texas scenes, and he says, Bob, these are the same. He's convinced they're the same. I don't think Vicky's is for the re- for one reason. The killer was in her store for about 20 minutes before he killed her. The other scenes, he's in and out within a minute. It uh, just seems odd. That would be a big change of pace for him. Why not kill her in the first minute? Why wait for 20? Plus, Vicky describes him as a weathered jockey, looked like he'd worked outdoors his whole life and was worn down. Tim Hickman describes his guy as a preppy-looking guy wearing a sport coat. So I don't think Vicky's description of what happens is the same. I don't know about the two in the Dallas area. And um, what was your second question? Uh, Roseman. I do think that I do think the key to the case is the Brosnan case, and I think what's going to happen here is Terre Haute police had enough information they thought on the Brosnan case with the identifications they had. They took it to the prosecuting attorney's office to go forward and charge someone with murder. Police department felt they had enough. The prosecuting attorney didn't. And this is a whole other bag of worms. Prosecuting attorneys are elected by the public. They want to keep their job. They don't want to lose a high-profile case. Uh, I've dealt with enough prosecuting attorneys to know that if it's a high-profile case and they're going forward, they want to have a 90% chance of a victory. And the Brosman case, obviously, for their prosecutor, did not feel like a 90% chance of victory. And they didn't take it. And it upset the police department. But they had a suspect. 
And they still have that suspect. That suspect is alive and well living in the Midwest. And the Terre Haute Police Department kept after him. They wanted to track him down. They wanted a DNA sample. He wouldn't kept after him years later, 20 years later almost. Wanted a DNA sample again. And this time they had a search warrant. And this time they got the DNA. And he remains the number one suspect in this case. But Cheryl Hoad's prosecuting attorney's office is not going forward. But that's not stopping the task force. The task force has other cities where homicides occurred. And if, and they're still working on this guy. And if they get enough, they're going to go to their prosecuting attorneys and say, let's go forward. Let's take a crack at it. But make no mistake, they have a suspect. They have a suspect. Does he look good for the other I-70 case? I know Brosman's not officially one, but does he look, does he look good all around? Tim Hickman says he does. Oh, man. Oh, man. Tim Hickman says he does. Oh, man. That's crazy. It really is. This case, I really, we, we cannot recommend your book enough to people who are interested in this case. And, and just to understand, like, how a strange serial killing like this, how, how the investigation almost works on the inside. Um, here's, here's one question for you uh, in, in terms of, you kind of touched upon this, but you know, and, and, and it sounds like there's so many dedicated law enforcement officials who are continuing to work this hard and continue to care about it. But why is it important for police to work these cold cases, even as, other cases, more modern cases, pile up around them. Why, why is it important to dedicate those resources? I, I think it's important just for their, it's, it's who they are and what they do. Uh, the lead detective on this case in Terre Haute was a man, that, a detective named Brad Rumsey. And um, a couple a couple months ago, uh, Brad and I hooked up. Uh, we wanted to get together. We hadn't seen each other since the task force. And uh, he knew I was working on the book. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't writing anything that was not up to, up to their approval. And uh, we got together um, for 18 holes of bad golf. And we're talking about old cases. Brad Rumsey had recently exhumed a woman's body from a 1967 homicide named Joanne Fox. We're now 60 years backwards. We're 30 years past the I-70 killer. And Brad Rumsey had information, had kept it, had kept a box with evidence in the basement. Now they had a possible DNA match. He got on an airplane and flew to Florida to question a man who was now 80 years old for a 60-year-old homicide case where the suspect was in his 20s. So you're saying to yourself, is that a good is that a good means of taxpayer money? You know what? I think it is. I think it just sends the message, sends the message that no crime is ever forgotten. And you kill somebody, we're coming after you till the end of time. And, and, and Brad Rumsey, he's convinced he has a chance to crack that case. It's 60 years old. He says, Bob, it's twice as old as the I-70 killer. Why would I give up on the I-70 killer? I'm working a case that's double that. That's a good point. The I-70 killer case is almost like a baby compared to some of those cold cases that are out there. Yeah, uh, but, you know, we see these cold cases now solved in the public. Didn't we just have the Long Island serial killer case call, uh, solved, or at least an arrest made? Mm -hmm. And that was national news for days, how horrific it was. Um, all I know is if they if they make an arrest in this case, I'll be there that day. How cool would it be if the person who tipped the police off and, you know, led to the big thing in this case was somebody who heard murder? Oh, my one of gosh. Your listeners, one of your listeners hears this and goes diving into this. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, that would be something. I mean, that would be our probably proudest moment on the show, honestly. But, so let me ask the obvious question. If there is someone out there listening right now who has information, who should they get in, in contact with? They should call their local police department or any of these five cities that had an I-70 case. Indy, Terre Haute, St. Louis, 
St. Charles, Wichita, Raytown, any of them. There's a hotline for the task force. Um, boy, I'll, they'll take your call. Let me put it that way. You will not get hung up on. You'll be treated like a king or a queen. We'd really like to thank you again for taking the time to do this interview. Before we wrap up the interview, is there anything you wanted to mention that we neglected to ask you about? No, just thank you both very, very much for what you do, not just on this case, but on others. And um, again, would Bob like to sell a book in his retirement? To be honest with you, I could care less. I'm going to spend more money traveling and promoting this book than any book sale is going to get me. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for these police officers and these families and these victim friends. And, you know, I can still... I can still make a difference in retirement. If I can do it here, it really would be as good as, you know, as good as anything I've ever done. It would be a tremendous feeling for me. Bob, thank you so much for talking to us. I mean, just we want to say, like, it's an excellent book, but we're just also in awe of all the work you've done on this case. You've, I feel like, moved the story forward again and again. But also there's such a humanity in, in this in this story about the people who are survivors of the victims and, and also the law enforcement officials who are just won't give up on it. And we just think that's really captured well. And that's a testament to your journalism. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I, I really do appreciate your time and your efforts. I really, really do. Thanks. Awesome. We want to thank Bob again for taking the time to speak with us today. We really enjoyed his book, which again is called Dead End, Inside the Hunt for the Interstate 70 Serial Killer. Please check it out. We'll include a link in our show notes, or you can look for it wherever you buy your books. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. If you're shopping while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast, then you know and love the thrill of the hunt. But are you getting the thrill of the best deals? Rakuten shoppers do. They get the brands they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Urban Outfitters, Samsung, and Adidas, and even stack sales on top of cash back. It's easy to use and you get your cash back through PayPal or check. The idea is simple. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N.